Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever, forever, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us forever, forever. some technical problems up here. I'm not real sure what they were, but that's why we're short a few musicians tonight. Let's sing This I Believe. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. I believe you rose again. Christ is Lord. I believe in you. I believe you rose again. I believe that Jesus Christ 
Christ is Lord. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with the Lord of care? Pray. Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find us solace there. Let's pray together tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for uh, all the truth in this song, Lord, that we can bring anything in this life to you, Father. Nothing too big, nothing too small. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you do care for us, Lord. And Father, I pray that you would draw us closer to you now through these next few moments. Bless the reading and preaching of your word, Lord. Bless the Lord's Supper to follow. And well, may we honor you in all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Got your Bibles? Go ahead and make your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I have to be off to the side like this because if I get right there, then the sound system makes noise. And I'm no, I don't like being off to the side like this. It's strange for me. But being off to the side, if I start preaching to y'all more than I do them, don't take offense, all right? I want to talk to you tonight just for a moment. Normally at the Lord's Supper uh, night, we would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we will uh, before we're done. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it was a part of my uh, daily reading uh, this week. As a matter of fact, I think today was the day that chapter 10 was uh, was in the reading for, for me. How many of y'all are reading through? You remember the, the Bibles that I uh, study, the, the daily Bible? Several of us. So if you are reading through that uh, with me, then we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, either yesterday or today. Was it today or was it yesterday? 
It ended today. Chapter 10 ended. It stopped in the middle. I always read it twice because I can't stop. I just keep going. And uh, it's hard for me to keep up with what I read when and really in being enjoying the Psalms, uh, going through the Psalms every day. What a blessing it is uh, to read those Old Testament words and those Old Testament songs and what a meaning they have for us today. But 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth and he's telling the church at Corinth something that's very odd to me. The church at Corinth, for the most part, was made up of Gentiles. It was not made up of Jewish believers. For the most part, there were Jewish believers there sprinkled in. Because remember, uh, when persecution comes to Jerusalem, they go, well, they go everywhere. And even before that, there were Jews that were uh, global in that day for the globe that was known, you know. And so uh, there are Jewish people there, but for the most part, they're Gentiles. But it gives the idea, gives the notion here that even Gentiles, when they would come to know Jesus, they would study Old Testament passages and understand what, uh, where the root is for the Christian faith. And the root for the Christian faith is in Judaism, what we know as your Old Testament uh, Jewish beliefs, where they had a priest and they had a temple and they had a uh, covenant and, and all those things. So they would go back and study those seemingly so that they would understand the history of where they had come from. Not to go back into the law necessarily. We don't study the Old Testament to go back into the law. Amen. We have been freed from that by the blood of Jesus Christ. I know it's Sunday night, but I ought to get a witness there. Amen? Amen. We are set free from anything that the law might bind us because of what Jesus has done for us when he shed his precious blood on the cross, but then stepped out of that grave victorious. So we study these things not to go back to those things, but to understand where they came from. And also, the other reason you study history... One is to repeat the good, but it's to not repeat the bad. Not to make the same mistakes twice. So if you look there in verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware. Now this is a phrase Paul uses quite often. He likes that phrase. He doesn't want us to be unaware. This is, a, um, this is an astute phrase. Peter would not make this same phrase. It, what Paul is trying to say is that I don't want you to not understand what God is up to. I don't want you to make a mistake and say, I never knew I shouldn't have made that. And when I say mistake, I mean sin. That's what we call sin, right? Now, No, it's a sin. I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Jesus. Now, here's what Paul starts out with. He starts out with the good of how God provided for his people. He says that the Lord provided in Moses' day. Now, he's going to tell us a lot of mistakes they made, a lot of sin that got in the camp. And he's going to go through some of those sins, and he's going to allude back to Exodus uh, 12 and 13 and 14 and Exodus 32 before he's done. But he starts out by saying that the Lord provided for them. He talks about the rock. And we sang the song, I heard the song sing not long ago, it's become my favorite. There's honey in the rock. There's water in the stone. I love that line. Love that line. It's so true that in the Old Testament day that the Lord would provide for them from water from the rock. The Bible says in Exodus 13, verses 17 through 22, it says, When Pharaoh let the people go, and you know the story of how Moses goes and says, Let my people go, he and his brother Aaron and, the, and all the plagues. And so he says in verse 13, when, uh, in chapter 13, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines, even though it was nearby. For God said, the people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. So he kept them out of war. The Lord provides. 
He, Lord, the Lord provides a way of safety. So he led the people around toward the Red Sea along the road of the wilderness. And the Israelites left the land of Egypt in battle formation. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear a solemn oath, saying, God will certainly come to your aid. Then you must take my bones with you from this place. They set out from Succoth and camped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during the day in a pillar of fire to give them light at night so they could travel day or night. The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night never left its place. Listen, from in front of the people. That's important. And Paul says that they all were baptized in that cloud. They were all baptized into that lordship baptism that they would follow the Lord wherever the Lord led. They wouldn't move. They waited for the cloud or for the fire to lead them. Why? Their provision was in the cloud. Their provision was in the fire. Their provision was in the Lord. You know our provision tonight's in the Lord. Everything we have need of, He wants to share. He owns it all. You know, on a Sunday night, I think we all, Sunday morning's always really busy. Y'all notice that? I've had people tell me down through the years, boy, we love Sunday night. Uh, we like Sunday night a lot better than Sunday morning. And, and, I, and I'll tell you why. The reason why is because it's more relaxed. You don't feel like you need to go shake hands with all the new folks, you know, on Sunday morning and trying to do all of that. It's, it's more relaxed. It's calmer. We're not, we're not rushed in any shape, form, or fashion. And there's not a, usually a lot of extra things on Sunday night. We come, we worship, preach, and we pray, and we go home. That's what we do. And it's more relaxed to do that. When you come on Sunday night, though, Sunday morning is full of all the Sunday morning stuff. And it's good, and I'm not knocking Sunday morning. I kind of like Sunday morning, don't you all? Amen, right? I don't want you to quit Sunday mornings just for Sunday nights. But, but it's full of a lot of stuff. The Sunday afternoon, usually at my house, it's a pretty, pretty calm afternoon. We don't, we don't work. We don't play. We don't do a lot of things like that. We rest on Sunday afternoon and come back to church. But I tell you what that does lend itself to thinking about all the problems of this life. Life has problems. Y'all notice that? I remember when I first surrendered to preach, and I'd hear preachers talk about problems and issues and how hard it was and blah, blah, blah. I used to think, man, they don't, they're not doing something right because my life's pretty good. At that time, we had a newborn uh, baby, and he didn't sleep at night. But other than that, life was pretty good, you know? But after you live a little while... And you go through some of those hard times, you realize life's not always, quote unquote, pretty good. And sometimes you come to church and you kind of carry that baggage around with you. Well, let me encourage you, just take the bag off tonight and understand the Lord will provide. I don't know what you're going through. I have no idea. But I bet if we sat down and talked, me and my family are going through some of the same things yours is. I asked my Sunday school class this morning, I said, this inflation junk and grocery bill price, I said, is that affecting all y'all? Because if it's just me, I'm going to be mad about it. I really am. And they all kind of laughed like you did. It, it affects everybody, right? I mean, we're all going through. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's a spiritual battle that you walked in here with. I have no idea, but I know this. If the Lord can lead the Israelites out of Egypt, if the Lord can part the Red Sea, if the Lord can bring water from a rock, he'll probably get you through your day tomorrow. Don't you agree? He'll provide. He has always been faithful to his people, even when his people walked in disobedience. You know the first thing they did when they got across the Red Sea? They complained. You know the first thing they said? Oh, we ought to go back to Egypt. Are you kidding me? You know Moses wanted to slap the one who said that. Are you kidding? I just went through all of that to get you out. Now you want to turn and go right back? 
But that's what, the, and God was still faithful. So don't think his faithfulness is bound up in our obedience because it's not. Now, we ought to walk in obedience, but whether we do or not, it's not bound for him. He will always be found faithful. He'll provide. He provides water from the rock. Now, there was this, there was this weird idea that this rock somehow followed the people as they went through. It was said that in that day, the Jewish people would, would say that this rock would follow them as they walked through the wilderness. Now, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. But here's what the Apostle Paul does say. That rock did follow them. Now, not physically. It's not what he's saying. But he says the rock that did follow them was the rock that is the Lord Jesus. You see, the Lord Jesus didn't just show up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Lord Jesus can be found as far back as when God made man. He looked and said, let us make man in our image. Who's he talking to? Well, the Father was talking to the Son and the Holy Spirit. This triune God has always been, and this Lord Jesus Christ didn't just show up as Lord when he stepped out of the grave. He was Lord when he came as a baby in the manger. He always has, and he always will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, the Apostle Paul says that this Lord is Jesus. Where does he get this idea from? Well, it's the same idea that Jesus asked the disciples in Matthew chapter 16. He says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And by the way, Son of Man was Jesus' favorite expression of of himself it was the expression that expressed deity in and of himself adam would have been known as a son of god moses would have been known as a son of god but this idea this terminology of son of man separates him from all of those old testament great saints but separates him and he loves to use that terminology why does he call himself the son of man because he is the son of man who has come to save man himself verse 14 says and they said that some say john the baptist others say elijah still others jeremiah and the prophets i love how they describe jesus because this is not the picture we get of jesus paul in the youth group wednesday night showed a picture and i can't tell you what the name of the picture was you remember the name of the picture paul salvador mundi savior of the world uh, and he was, you know, how much is it worth? I don't know, was it worth a million dollars, ten million, or something like that? It's worth a lot of money. A lot more money than I had, so I didn't worry about it. But in that picture, you see Jesus with the long, flowing hair, you know, and, and he blue eyes. And y'all, I don't know what he looked like, but I doubt he had blue eyes. I mean, he was a dark-skinned man from a dark-skinned area. He was Jewish. As a matter of fact, just to be real honest with you, the actual area of Nazareth and that region there, most of the people there are about my height. So he probably looked more like me than any of y'all. <laughs> I'm just saying he probably was a short man. Amen. <laughs> my kind of guy. I don't know what he looked like, but he didn't look like those pictures we've seen. How do you know? Well, some said he was John the Baptist. Who is John the Baptist? He was this wild, long-haired, long beard. He ate locusts and wild honey. He came in wearing camel skin, which, by the way, was not normal in that day. He lived out in the desert places. He would come in, and I doubt he smelt great when he showed up. So that's who Jesus, they said, possibly was. The other one was a mirror image of John the Baptist. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist was a mirror image of the other one, Elijah. Elijah was a wild and crazy prophet who would do some wild and crazy things. And so would Jeremiah, and so would every other prophet. If you were to have known Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, there would be times you would not like them because they would tell you like it is. My first church, I, I went to preach and had no clue what I was doing. I could preach a little, but that's about it. I mean, I, and I wasn't good at that. I mean, 
One of the guys in that church, Big Kenny is what I always called him, still called him that, wore overalls, great big guy. Uh, Kenny was probably 6'6", six, 6'8". Six, six, uh, he was a big, big man, and he was a farmer. Kenny came to the to the parson, or excuse me, to the uh, the office there at the church one day, and here's what Big Kenny said. He said, "Preacher, he said since since you've come, and and everybody's just real excited. He said it's like going to a revival service every time they come to church when they hear you preach. Man, they like that. They like that. And he said, you know, he said I told a couple of them. Said, well, you like it now, but two years from now, how will you like it?" And he said, Preacher, I'm worried about you, so I'm praying for you. And when you need me, you call me. And he left. Now, at the time, I had been in the ministry probably going on two years. And I didn't think much about it. But there was a lot of truth in that. And here's why there's a lot of truth in that. Everybody likes to hear a good sermon. I mean, you know, against sin and all of that. But when you hear that every time you show up, it takes a different group of people to stay with that. That's who Jesus was. That's why every time he gathered up a big crowd, he'd run them off. Every time. He did one of two things with big crowds. He either ran them off or he left them. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Or one of the other prophets. Jesus asked him, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed. And here's why. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who was in heaven. He says, and I also say that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the forces of Hades or the gates of hell will not overpower it. And he does not say, I'm building my church on Peter. If you know much about Peter, thank you, Lord. He says, I'm building my church on the truth that I am the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's the foundational truth of the church. And by the way, it's still true today. Jesus is Lord. We'll come to this table in a moment, and we'll celebrate that he is Lord. He's still Lord. It doesn't matter what happens around us. He is still Lord. He is still provider, and he is still in charge. Look there in verse 5. The Apostle Paul says that word, nevertheless, it's kind of like that word, therefore. If it's there, you need to know why it's nevertheless there. It's there to connect the verses before with the verses that follow. He says that Christ was the rock who followed them, but he said, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now, these things happen as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play, nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 of them fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. So what happens? Well, the Lord provides, but the Lord also will persecute. He will come against his people when they go against him. And Paul just kind of goes down a laundry list of things that they had done. What had they done? Idolatry. The Israelites were barely out of Egypt when they fell down to worship idols. It, 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 it's amazing to read it. I mean, you know, we, we read this morning when you get into the end of chapter 9 in the book of Acts, how it's been 10 years since Pentecost. But the Israelites, man, it's been like seven days and they start worshiping idols. And God had done some miraculous things like turning the water into blood and the locusts and all those things that didn't touch the Israelites but did touch the Egyptians. And then, you know, there was that one thing about the firstborn died, everyone in the land of Egypt except for the Israelites because they had the blood over their doorpost. And, he got, and then if that wasn't enough, they got stuck between a rock and a wet place and God parted the waters and they walked across and it, the waters had no more Swamp the Egyptians, and they begin to complain and murmur and follow false gods. The apostle Paul says, don't let this happen. 
Because he said the reason it's written, the reason we know about it is because it, so it would be an example to us as what not to do. In other words, this was historical truth in fact, but don't do that. Don't crave what they craved. What did they crave? Well, they craved idols. They craved idols. They craved foreign gods. Exodus chapter 32 records of how they had this immoral, wild party. And you remember Moses is up on the mountain, and the people got tired of waiting on Moses. They got impatient. Anybody else in here impatient? I'm impatient. They got impatient. They got tired of waiting. And so they went to Aaron, and you remember what they said? They said, Aaron, we don't know what's happened to Moses, so here's what we need you to do. We need a God, because Moses is probably gone now. And so Moses gets all of their gold, he melts it down, and he forms this calf. You remember what he tells Moses when Moses comes down and says, what in the Sam Hill are you doing? That's a direct quote, by the way. I'm sure that's what he said. And you remember what Aaron said? Aaron said, man, they gave me their gold. I put it in fire and poof, here come this cow. I don't know what happened. I have no idea. That's exactly what he said. They begin to bow down to a golden image. It's amazing to even say it out loud, isn't it? In church, if we don't watch ourselves, we'll probably not gather together and melt our gold down in that way. But we'll bow to the idols of this world. And I'm going to tell you, there's a big one about to take place this fall. The idol of politics. And I don't care if you vote for Democrat or Republican. That's not what I'm. Politics will not fix this nation. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that will fix this nation. And listen, it doesn't start with Washington. It starts with me. It starts with me. And I can't do anything about you. And I can't do anything. I can do a lot less about them other than vote some out. And I hope to do that. And I hope to vote some in. And you say, who are you going to vote out and who are you going to vote in? It ain't none of your business, brother. I'm just like Barney Fife on the Andy Griffith Show. Who I vote for, brother, is my business. My hope's not in that. My hope is in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ working by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I still believe in the church. I'm telling you, I don't think she's dead. I think there are true born-again believers that are still reading their Bible, are still praying, are still witnessing, and still doing what God has called them to do. And don't think that I, for some weird reason, look out on a Sunday morning and say, well, everybody who comes here does that. I know that that's not true. I also know that that's not true even on a Sunday night. And so if you're out of that will, you need to get back in it. You need to get back in the center of God's will. Start reading your Bible every day. Uh, start praying every day. Start witnessing as much as possible every chance you get. And if you think for some reason I've retired from that, well, then you are wrong because you are still alive. And even when you retire from that in eternity, you haven't retired from that because you're going to work when you get there too. Amen. But what we can't do is bow to the idolatry that is around us. How do we know that's wrong? The Bible tells us so that the people would rise up verse 8 now let us act immorally as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one day and that's the same story in Exodus chapter 32 but not only idolatry but sexual immorality this idea of rising to play means exactly what you think it means it was a sexual orgy that Moses came down the mountain and was witnessing before his very eyes among God's people. And I think when he came down, there had to be a moment that just took his breath away. And here I am in the presence of Jehovah God on this mountain. And this is what the people that I'm supposed to lead are doing. Had to be a moment of shock. 
Look there in verse 9. It says, nor let us try the Lord. Now, it's not test the Lord is what he's saying. As some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. This testing of God can be found in Numbers chapter 21. The Bible says, then they set out from Mount Hor uh, by the way of the Red Sea to bypass the land of Edom. But the people became impatient because of the journey. There's that impatient thing again. Verse 5 says, The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you led us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? Well, he hadn't. <laughs> you know, crazy. There's no bread or water, and we detest this wretched food. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit them so that many Israelites died. The people then came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord so that he will take the snakes away from us. Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake image, mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten and he looked at the bronze snake... He was healed. The people tested the Lord's patience with their impatience. And God says, all right, we'll take some of you away. And he sends those poisonous snakes. Not Satan. Not the demons. God does. And I'm going to tell you, down through the years, I've seen situations that I'd said, God took them. And I can't prove it. But when I get to heaven, I'll find out if I'm right, and it won't matter then, right? But I'm going to tell you, you get in the way of the Lord's work. You start complaining and murmuring and idolatry, sexual immorality, all these things among God's people. I'm not talking about lost folks. I'm talking about people who are born again, saved. God can, God has, and he will continue to purge it from his people. I'm going to tell you, that's a scary thought. It just keeps me reading my Bible. And it keeps me on my knees. And when I say purges, I don't mean he sends them to hell. He takes them to heaven. Because you're going to heaven is not based on who you are or how you act or what you do. It's based on who you know. And if they know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then they are going to heaven. And God's people get out of God's will. Wouldn't you agree? Let me just ask this. Anybody in here who has always been in the perfect will of God, no matter what, you know you've always been perfect since you met Jesus, but you need to go to another church. You're in the wrong place because we are sinners saved by grace, right? I'm not saying we ought to be perfect. What I am saying is we ought to follow him. We ought not follow the same path. Now look in verse 10. I love how he adds verse 10. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. They grumbled. If idolatry wasn't bad enough, if sexual morality wasn't bad enough, they just, they flat out complained a lot. You ever been around a negative person like that? They just grumble about everything. I mean, it doesn't matter. And, 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 and church life can be some of the worst places to hear grumbling. Walk in, it's too cold. Walk in, it's too hot. Walk in, the music's too loud. Well, I can't hear a thing. The sermon's too long. Amen. <laughs> it's too long for me. I don't know why y'all sit there and listen to it that long. I'd get them leave. I mean, it's just too long. And then a short sermon comes along. Well, he didn't study much this week. <laughs> can't win for losing, I'm telling you. Too much humor, not enough. Not loud enough, he yells all the time. God's people are probably the best group of complainers that I've ever been around. And Paul says, don't do that. Because they did it in your Old Testament. And God didn't like that. <laughs> and he didn't like it to the point that he took some of them out. Verse 11 says, 
Now, these things happened to them, listen, as an example to us. They were written for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who, who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Here's what that verse, it spoke to the person in the room who heard about the idol, don't have those. Sexual immorality, I'm good there. The complaining, no, never, not me. All of that, that's not, none of that's for me. And so the Apostle Paul says, let him who thinks he stands, listen. Take a deep breath. Look in the mirror one more time, lest you fall. And some days, and some moments in my life, they're rare, but there's some moments in my life I think I'm doing pretty good. I'm reading my Bible every day, praying every day. I think I'm following him as, as best I know how. And I'm going to tell you, those days bother me a lot more than those days that I think things are not right. Because it's in those moments that I find myself, not on purpose, I would never do it on purpose, but I find myself kind of getting puffed up with pride. And what pride will do is make you look down your nose at some other class of people if you're not careful. He says, take heed. If you think you're standing, that you don't fall. And then verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. Listen, God is faithful. There's that provision again. He'll not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, we'll provide the way of escape so that you'll be able to endure it. Mo well, a lot of you are not old enough to remember, but some of you are well old enough to remember. Flip Wilson. Y'all remember Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. What you can't do is say, well, God made me do it because he's the one who brings temptation into my life. And he allows it. Nothing happens in our lives without him allowing it. What you can't say is that God brought the temptation, and so when I fall, it's his fault. Paul says, no, it's not. Because with every temptation that he allows in our lives, he gives us a way of escape. If you look back, and I'm talking about major sin in our life, not just a little white lie and things like that. Those are bad. I'm talking about the major points, and we can all look back and see major points of sin in, in our lives. If you look back and if you think hard enough, you'll see God provided a way out. God gave you option B, but you didn't take it. You failed temptation. The Apostle Paul says that the Lord will provide for us a way that is better than what this old flesh tells us to do. The way of escape. A quote-unquote higher road, if you will. A place where we can say no to the temptation and yes to Jesus. Not once, not twice, but every single time. So when we are tempted to sin, what should we do? Lord, where is my escape? Where do you want me to bypass this sin? Lord, where do you want me to say no to this idolatry in my life? Where do you want me to say no? How do you want me to say no to this sexual immorality in my life? Lord, how do you, I've been complaining and grumbling and mumbling. How do you want me to say no to that in my life? I know it's wrong. Now, how do I stop it? And Paul says there's always a different road. You know, on Sunday, you never know what a week may hold, right? Some weeks are good and great, and you just say, man, it's a great week. Some weeks are just, ugh, we got through that week, right? Thank you, Lord, I'm still alive. That's about the best I got this week, you know? I have no idea what you'll go through this week, but I know this, the Lord is our provider. I, I know this, everything the Israelites did, you don't have to do. But you can choose to live a life that is fully surrendered to the one that we're about to celebrate. But the choice is up to you. Now, I've got even better news than that. This week, if you fall, probably a bad word, isn't it? When you fall, 
we serve a God who forgives. We serve a God of grace. And I'm going to tell you, if we didn't serve a God of grace, I wouldn't be here tonight with my Bible open. I wouldn't even be allowed to read it, much less preach from it. But thank goodness for Jesus. And we're going to come to the Lord's table in just a moment. We're going to invite everyone to come to the Lord's table who's here. The Bible does not teach, in, in my opinion, this church's opinion, just members of this church. But what the Bible teaches is all who have been saved by Jesus Christ. There are some qualifications. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul says that a man should examine his heart. For qualification number one, come to the Lord's table is to be saved, to know Jesus. Do you know that you know that if you had died, you'd go to heaven? I'm going to tell you it's important. It's the biggest question you'll ever answer in your life. And I'm so glad when I was eight years old, I gave my heart to Jesus. I am so thankful for that moment. I've never regretted it. And so if you're in the room tonight and you've never been saved, I want you to know he will save you. And he would save you if you call on his name tonight. Now you can come forward and make it known, and we hope you would if you do. But you don't have to do that to be saved. You can be saved right where you are. I had a senior adult man who always had a hard time coming up front, and he never wanted to go up front. And he heard me make that statement in a funeral one day, and he walked out the door, and he said, Brother Doug, today was my day. I trusted Jesus. Praise the Lord. But if you do trust him, we will give you a chance to make it known. The Bible says, the Lord Jesus said that if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before the Father. So it is important to make it known. Secondly, have you been baptized? Been saved, but have you been scripturally baptized? And by scriptural baptism, I mean by immersion in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some don't make a big issue of that, and I understand that they don't, but the Bible does. And it's important. It's important because it's an act of obedience to what Jesus taught. And so have you been baptized? And then after that, you say, well, I've been saved and baptized. I'm good. Maybe. Maybe. Don't, don't tune me out yet. Have you confessed your sin? And by confessing your sin, it's more than just saying I have sin in my life. But have you honestly went through and looked at your heart? Lord, these are my issues. Maybe it's one of the issues that the Israelites had. Maybe you complain. Maybe you grumble. Maybe it's idolatry. You don't have a golden calf at home, but there are things that are taking the Lord's place in your life, and that's idolatry. Maybe it's sexual immorality. Maybe it's not a physical act. Maybe it's something you look at on the Internet. Now, I don't know where you are, but I know this. God wants to forgive it, but he can't forgive it until you confess it. And so confession is good for your soul. And if you've not confessed and prayed up, then don't come to this table. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that some in Corinth were sick and others had died because they came to this table and had not examined their own hearts. So man, be sure your sins are forgiven. Now, if you've been saved and you've been scripturally baptized and you examine your heart, say, Lord, as best I know how, I've confessed my sin. We'll give you a chance to do that in invitation in just a moment. Then when this comes around, when the cups come around, please take one and join in and celebrate with us, our Lord and Savior. Here's what will happen when the deacons come around in a few moments. They'll hold it out, and if you take one, they'll give you one. The Bible does not say for the church to examine. The Bible says for you to examine. And when you take one, you're saying, my heart's right, I'm saved, I've been baptized, and I'm ready to come to the Lord's table. If you say, Brother Doug, I've got some questions about some of those things that you talked about, then don't take it. Come find me after and say, hey, we got to sit down and talk. All minds clear. We're going to pray. Brother Paul's going to come, and he'll lead us in a time of invitation. If you need to come kneel on the altar, you come kneel on the altar. Hey, I'll tell you something else. What if God brings to mind a wrong 
that you have committed against someone else in this room. Let me tell you what you ought to do. You ought to go to them and make it right. In these moments, don't wait until we're done. You won't do it. Do it now. No time to be obedient to the Lord than right now. I'm going to tell you, a church, if you want to see a church that really sees revival, it's when its members get right with God, with each other. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for these moments of truth from your word. Father, as best I know how, I've, I've preached what I feel like you've asked me to preach. But Lord, in these moments, I pray that you'd help us to examine our hearts. Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, then Father, I pray they'd come to know you. Maybe even right now, that they would confess to you that they are a sinner and believe for the very first time that you died for their sins and that you rose from the dead. Father, your word says that all who call on your name will be saved. And Lord, if there's someone here tonight calling on your name for the very first time, and Father, I pray that they'd make it known, give them boldness to stand up and stand out and say, I have believed. Father, there may be others who have believed, but they've not been baptized, and you've spoken to their heart. They need to be baptized. Father, I pray that they take the first steps tonight to get baptized and to set up a time to do that. Father, there may be others outside of your will in whatever area of their life. I have no idea. But Lord, I just pray that you would draw and move in hearts tonight. Father, this invitation is yours. Use it as you see fit. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. If you need to come, you come as we sing. Upon a hill, a perfect Savior. Upon that day, the greatest love, the punishment that should have fallen on us. Upon Him, upon Him, upon His head, the crown of thorns, upon His heart. A broken world, the wage of sin, the weight of our transgressions, upon Him, upon Him. Hey, if you believe it, let's sing it. Christ has died, we are forgiven in Christ alive, we are the shall come again. Praise the King. Praise the King. Amen. You may be seated. If our deacons will go ahead and make their way to the front. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, when the Lord institutes his supper, the Bible says that while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He also took the cup, and he blessed it, and gave it to his disciples. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you so much for what these, these cups represent. Father, the, the bread representing your body, and the, the juice representing your blood. Father, we ask now that you would bless these moments in remembrance of you. And Father, not that we just remember you once a month, but Father, once a month we set aside a time. We come to your table. Father, we ask for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.
The Bible says after he'd given it to his disciples, he said, Take ye, and this is my body. The Bible says he gave the cup out, he'd given thanks, and he said, Drink from it, all of you. The Lord goes on to say, For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Aren't you glad? Aren't you grateful for his blood? Now, every time we come in here, I know it's just once a month we celebrate the Lord's Supper, but every time you come, you're celebrating two things. The Lord's Supper, what his body and his blood means, and Easter Sunday when up from the grave he arose. Brother Paul, let's all stand with Brother Paul, and he's going to lead us in a song. You know, I always make that little joke at the end. Bible says that then they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, I don't plan to go. You could. But after the song is done, you are dismissed. Brother Paul. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace.